Well, Monarch Legacy of Monsters is heading into its final two episodes for the first season, and the tension is surely escalating as the Monarch Civil War takes unexpected twists. As our heroes, Kate, Kentaro, and May, strive to confront Lee once more in an effort to divert him from a potentially harmful path, the stakes are higher than ever. Plus, the recent encounter with Godzilla in the present definitely adds a new layer to the unfolding drama. Meanwhile, the flashback sequences in Episode 8 promise significant developments for Monarch, shaping the latest chapter of the Monsterverse. In the previous episode of Monarch Legacy of Monsters, the narrative primarily focuses on May's past, unveiling her true identity as Korra. Yeah, that's her real name, but we will continue calling her May just to avoid any confusion. Anyways, May's history ties back to her employment at AET, which transformed into Apex cybernetics by the end of the episode, the ultimate force behind Mechagodzilla's creation. When AET sought to settle their dues with May for wiping off millions of dollars worth of their work involving animal torture, Kate, Kentaro, and Tim intervened to rescue her. But it was actually Natalia Verdugo who orchestrated a deal with AET's Brenda Holland, leveraging May's presence to secure Kate's cooperation in finding Lee Shaw. Speaking of Shaw, he leads Duval and ex-monarch soldiers to Alaska, successfully sealing the Hollow Earth portal after dispatching an ice-breathing Frost Vark Titan. Now, of course, Shaw's motivations become clear as he plays Batman, aiming to save Earth from the monsters of Hollow Earth. Now, in the latest episode, May reconciles with the group and pursues the rogue Shaw. Alongside, the past timeline unfolds a touching love story between Bill and Keiko. Their romance develops organically, marked by chivalrous gestures and intimate moments, fueled by a shared passion for science and titan discovery, which contrasts with Keiko and Shaw's relationship in Terrifying Miracles, which appears more physical and one-sided. Episode 8 of Monarch Legacy of Monsters explores the thinning line between good and evil, hinting at a potential new antagonist. While the episode shows some improvement, it still grapples with the persisting issue of cliched action dialogue. Anyways, without wasting another moment, let's intricately explore what all of the fuss is really about. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The main trio teams up with Monarch in the present timeline. In the 2015 timeline, Lee Shaw leads his new team of soldiers to Kazakhstan, clearly driven by a thirst for revenge following the tragic death of his lover Keiko in the 50s. In the initial episodes, we had witnessed that Keiko was killed in an abandoned base, overrun by a swarm of newly hatched titan creatures, so Lee is now on a mission to settle the score in the present day. During the journey to to the titan-infested plant in Kazakhstan, Lee reflects on the past, recalling the day he, Keiko, and Bill visited the same location. However, Duval brings him back to the present, grounding him in the mission at hand. On the other hand, Tim guides May, Kate, and Kentaro to Monarch, but it was Kate who noticed the absence of photos of Bill and Keiko despite their status as Monarch royalty, only to learn about Bill's complex history with the institution from Tim. Despite Bill's dedicated service to Monarch until his death, the recognition of his contribution seems evidently lacking, particularly regarding his findings on the Hollow Earth, which is a concept validated in the MonsterVerse time and again. The unfairness of this erasure becomes apparent, but it does hint towards some development that Bill and Keiko may eventually receive the recognition they deserve. Now, returning to the main plot, Natalia requests Kate's help in locating Lee Shaw, emphasizing the potential of dire consequences of his actions. Verdugo provides the team with the latest information on Lee's recent activities, who has set off explosives in Alaska, resulting in a complete cessation of gamma ray emissions at that rift. However, gamma ray emissions have surged at all other locations, indicating a potential impending scenario reminiscent of G-Day. The urgency now lies in predicting Lee's next move to prevent further catastrophic events from unfolding. 
And of course, the absence of Hiroshi's map further complicates the task for the group, as Natalia reminds them of the significance of their skills acquired through their global journeys for Hiroshi. But they soon figure out Shaw's next target location as they work together to piece together his current whereabouts. Kate stumbles upon a file documenting Keiko's tragic death in Kazakhstan, prompting Tim to note an unusual spike in gamma radiation at that spot. And of course, that spot was also marked on Hiroshi's map. Though Natalia remains skeptical about Shaw's location, she grants Kate, May, Kintaro, and Tim permission to assemble a small team and head to Kazakhstan. The OG trio in 50s timeline would have almost lost the Monarch funding if it were not for Lee. Through a detour to the 50s within the episode every now and then, we see the younger versions of Lee Shaw, Keiko Miura, and Bill Randa as they contend with their new boss, the naval officer Hatch. Now, Hatch is determined to shut down their Titan hunting project, using racially charged remarks against Keiko and her mysterious past, which of course incites anger in the trio, leading Bill to take the initiative and throw a punch at Hatch. Pretty shocking given Bill's demeanor. The the narrative soon shifts to Bill, Lee, and Keiko being confined to a modest office by Hatch, a stark contrast to the lavish workspace they previously occupied, and a heated debate ensues on whether to disclose Godzilla's survival after the H-bomb explosion, given that it was the only key to escaping their predicament. Even if Keiko opposes revealing this information, fearing more significant bomb attacks, Lee advocates for transparency to pursue their Titan studies, which is in fact for the great good. So, to navigate the situation, Lee devises a plan involving a detailed case study and a comprehensive map of their Titan knowledge, intending to persuade Puckett to let them lead Monarch instead of Hatch. As it goes, Bill and Keiko then compile their gathered information into a comprehensive report. This is where we see a palpable connection form between them, as Keiko admires Bill for standing against Hatch's racism, while Bill praises Keiko for her trust trustworthiness and overall remarkable qualities. Even if it appears that Bill might confess his feelings for Keiko, they decide to channel their focus into advancing their Hollow Earth theory. Together, they mark all the locations on Earth where Titans have been observed. Standing right outside the room, Lee Shaw observes the chemistry between Bill and Keiko, realizing he stands no chance with her. However, instead of reacting like how you would expect a typical army guy to react, he takes a surprising approach. Before the budget proposal meeting, Shaw chooses to present Bill and Keiko's work to Puckett, advocating for their reinstatement as the heads of Monarch, after revealing that Godzilla is alive. Bill finds out Keiko's secret. While watching an ant slip through a hole in the middle of a page, Bill has a revelation about the existence of an entire ecosystem beneath the Earth's surface, which is in fact the source of all the Titans. This revelation completely aligns with what viewers witnessed in the maximalist masterpiece Godzilla vs. Kong. Eager to share his discovery, Bill rushes to Keiko's house, where he learns that the suspicious past Hatch had referred to actually involves Keiko's son, Hiroshi. It then becomes clear that Keiko was previously married before World War II and had a son with her late husband. As a widow, she then pursued a better future for Hiroshi, applying to Berkeley and chasing her ambitious dreams. After hearing everything, Bill then assures Keiko of his commitment to supporting her and preventing her from failure. Now, this revelation clearly contradicts the theory suggested earlier in the episode, including by Kate, that Lee Shaw is Hiroshi Hiroshi's father and Kate and Kentaro's grandfather. Instead, it goes out on a stretch to confirm that Hiroshi is Keiko's son and Bill's stepson. We finally see another Hollow Earth portal in the present timeline. In the 2015 storyline, Kate and her team embark on a journey to Kazakhstan in search of Lee. While exploring the abandoned building, they come across piles of shells or exoskeletons left behind by the creatures responsible for Keiko's death years ago. It does not take much time for Kate to deduce that these creatures are growing and shedding their skin as they evolve. As they proceed, the team discovers a tunnel at the building's center, precisely where Keiko met her demise. 
and that tunnel is none other than the infamous Hollow Earth. But unlike the one in Alaska, this portal appears regular without emitting a strange light. Now, this tunnel leads downward, and the team uncovers Lee's strategically placed explosives throughout the site. While Tim asks his monarch colleague if their team could defuse the bomb, Duval suddenly appears with her own team, holding them at gunpoint. As Tim and his colleague approach, Duval appears out of nowhere, warning them to step away from the device. Followed by this, Lee emerges from the shadows, urging Kate to follow him for an important conversation. Lee then reveals to Kate the concept of the Hollow Earth, proposing the theory that the Godzilla in the MonsterVerse serves as a gatekeeper. According to Lee, this version of Godzilla prevents Titans from traversing from the Hollow Earth to Earth and vice versa, thus acting as a safeguard and a protector. While this explanation suits this iteration of Godzilla, it can be acknowledged as a more straightforward allegory compared to the complex symbolism found in some earlier Godzilla films, including the recent release of Godzilla Minus One. The classic films often used Godzilla as a symbol for nuclear weapons or warfare, making this portrayal of him as a superhero, which is indeed a deviation from tradition. Nevertheless, it is still deemed more preferable than portraying Godzilla solely as a mindless monster or for comedic effect. Now, Lee believes that his mission to seal the portals between Earth and Hollow Earth is a noble endeavor, aiming to save the planet and even help Godzilla himself. However, Kate challenges this, suggesting that Lee's true motivation actually stems from a sense of responsibility for Keiko's death. Lee does not deny it, and in this moment, the performances of Kurt and Wyatt Russell begin to meld seamlessly. The episode ends with a new titan and a massive cliffhanger. In the concluding scenes of Monarch Legacy of Monsters Episode 8, tensions escalate as Tim and Duval engage in a heated argument regarding the latter's mission. Duval emphasizes that her sister might have survived if Monarch had closed the portals, clearly asserting that if they failed to seal them now, it would result in the loss of more lives. On the other hand, Lee echoes a similar sentiment to Kate and initiates the countdown for the explosive devices. These ensuing detonations give rise to a gigantic beetle-like titan crawling out of the portal, attacking everyone in its path. However, the explosions cause the titan, May, Kate, and Shaw to plummet right into the portal, leading to the collapse of the remaining structure and likely sealing off the portal. While the fate of Tim, Duval, Kintaro, and the remaining soldiers remains uncertain, it is assumed they may attempt to access the Hollow Earth through another portal to rescue Kate, May, and Shaw. And that is absolutely possible, given that Shaw has himself affirmed that he has been to the portal himself and gotten back. Now, for those who have seen Godzilla vs. Kong, almost all of Shaw's arguments gain validity as the film depicted Apex Cybernetics harnessing Hollow Earth's energy to power Mechagodzilla, highlighting the allure of the Hollow Earth's abundant resources. The narrative also implied that human interference in the Hollow Earth could lead to catastrophic consequences, necessitating the sealing off of access. The upcoming episodes might unveil who thwarted Lee's supporters from cutting off Earth from Hollow Earth, potentially setting the stage for the apocalyptic events witnessed in Godzilla King of Monsters, Godzilla vs. Kong, and of course, the upcoming Godzilla x Kong The New Empire. But the survival of Kate, Shaw, and May is shrouded in uncertainty, especially considering the perilous journey to the Hollow Earth depicted in Godzilla vs. Kong. Plus, the lack of specialized transport, akin to that film's characters, raises concerns about the trio's safety. While Shaw hinted at the possibility of such a journey, the true outcome remains unknown until the series resumes in 2024, leaving viewers in suspense regarding their voyage to the center of the planet. Who is the newest kaiju in the Monarch's monster roster? Before y'all come at us for not emphasizing more on the two-second screen time for the kaiju at hand, we must definitely discuss more on this insectoid titan with whatever little information we have at hand. Now, these humongous beetles are actually known as endoswarmers, and while they are not explicitly named on screen, Keiko Randa initially refers to them as some new form of muto upon encountering their egg 
legs in the initial episodes. Now, endoswarmers have a distinctive appearance resembling anthropods, particularly millipedes or centipedes. They feature shorter, armored bodies, a single row of sharpened spikes on their backs, and elongated legs. Dark gray in color with orange highlights, they are almost twice the size of an adult human and emerge from round, semi-transparent eggs glowing with vibrant orange hues. As endopedes mature, they retain the chitinous armor and multiple limbs seen in their larval forms but grow substantially larger. These creatures possess four massive horn-like mandibles attached to a quad-jawed maw with circular rows of sharp teeth, along with tentacle-like appendages. Their undersides sporadically grow with a deep orange hue, and they lack visible eyes while having long antennae on their heads. These endoswarmers displayed cooperative behavior when pursuing Dr. Keiko Randa and Lee Shaw in Kazakhstan, piling on top of each other to create a larger, more terrifying entity. It was Bill Randa who theorized that the endoswarmers were drawn to the surface by the activation of a nuclear power plant, indicating a preference for radiation. The creatures are also predatory, feeding on both radiation and any prey they encounter. On a side note, female endopedes lay large clutches of eggs in radiation-rich nurseries to nourish their offspring. In terms of durability, endopedes prove impervious to large falling debris, such as concrete from the Kazakh power plant. They can also withstand gravitational inversion, experiencing a sudden reversal of a planet's worth of gravity when traversing hollow Earth portals. Notably, their speed matches that of humans, and their strength allows them to over overpower an adult human, especially when swarming. Endopedes utilize lengthy tendrils to capture and pull prey into their maws. But the endoswarm scene in Episode 8 was truly terrifying, and seemed like it could tear apart many human beings at once. But I think we know that Shaw's bomb could take down Frost Fart. Killing this beetle is surely a piece of cake in comparison. What is our verdict on this episode? In terms of structure, Birthright stands out as an exemplary episode within the series. Both past and present storylines are engaging, offering a well-balanced distribution of screen time and meaningful connections between them. Meanwhile, Wyatt and Kurt Russell deliver compelling performances that effectively convey Shaw's fall from grace in the past and his antagonistic transformation in the present. Overall, the episode maintains strong character dynamics, skillfully balanced tones of comedy and drama. The crazy cliffhanger ending adds just the appropriate level of tension, heightening anticipation for the final two episodes. Despite its excellence, there is still a lingering sense that Birthright might have benefited from an extra character moment or an extended monster set piece. Additionally, some of us may have hoped for a payoff to the teased romantic storyline between Kate and May. While Birthright falls just short of claiming the title of the best episode, it it remains a standout installment and effectively sets the stage for the impending two-part finale. As of now, Episode 5, The Way Out, still holds the crown, but Birthright contributes significantly to the series' overall appeal. But this episode surely opened up a lot of potential for Keiko, given that she fell into the hollow earth. I mean, if Lee could come back alive, it would surely not be surprising for them to find Keiko in the hollow earth, given that time passes differently in other dimensions. Plus, maybe we will finally see Hiroshi's character living up to his potential in the next two episodes, and helping his son Kentaro to get all the fallen characters out of Hollow Earth. What do you think might happen? Let us know in the comment box below.